In business, complex terms are often couched in simple expressions. One of the reasons for this, of course, is that business leaders have to communicate some powerful ideas very effectively to large organisations, to analysts, to a whole range of stakeholders. So both academics and people involved in the management of businesses are always trying to find new insights, but to present them in really catchy ways. And so this notion of couching the complex in simple terms is something that I want to revisit in throughout the course uh, to remind us of some of the key terms and how some of these simple, catchy expressions actually open up a wide range of interesting issues and insights about the kind of challenges that are faced in business. We've already seen one when we talked about the origins of the firm, make or buy. Do you do it inside the company or do you outsource it? Make or buy. Uh, this week we have a couple of other terms. Uh, we talk about economies of scale and economies of scope. Now these basic concepts come from economics and they're absolutely vital to thinking about business. Economies of scale, really quite straightforward. Uh, simply put, the more you make, the cheaper you can make each one. Each one, okay? So if you want to make one muffin, obviously there's a lot of work. If you want to make 36 muffins, three trays of muffins, uh, assuming you've got a large enough oven, um, it's almost no more work. Maybe a little bit more electricity, but maybe not, maybe even the same amount. So we see in so many industries, simply those who can produce at larger scale can bring down their marginal costs. And this is another concept we'll keep coming back to, thanks to economics. The cost of making an additional unit, that's the notion of marginal cost, like the cost of adding one additional student to a class, uh, the cost of making one additional car when you're already making one million cars in a factory a year. That's marginal cost. So those scale economies, to be able to manufacture at scale, to produce at scale and bring down your costs is a key principle in economics and business. It helps to answer that question we posed in this week's lecture, and that is, why do we have a few big companies and why do we also have lots of small companies? One of the implications for the small companies is that uh, the nature of the product doesn't really rest on scale economies. And one of the simple examples I always offer is in cooking. Mass-produced omelettes taste really, really horrible. You know, if you've been to a typical breakfast buffet, uh, the one thing we often want to have is eggs for morning. In the morning, you open up the hot box and there's this big mushy pile of egg. Of course, really nice hotels will make an omelette to order, and we know it's very different. It's a much nicer uh, culinary experience. So in a range of cuisines, we see that if you try to scale it up too big, you have to make real compromises in terms of quality. You get away from that artisanal, uh, very sense-driven uh, culinary skill that we see in uh, fine cuisine. On the other hand, of course, if we just want to eat uh, cheaply and reliably, we see the other extreme. We see McDonald's with uh, massive scale economies. What that means is that we can eat quite reliable food, not bad, uh, guaranteed to not poison us uh, because their controls are so good. And be because it's produced at such scale, it really is quite astonishingly cheap. If you think of what uh, a McDonald's meal costs you compared to um, an hour's income even is... Uh, you know, as a, in a part-time job as a student, uh, one quickly realises that the, uh, the scale effects are really significant. And in so many fields of manufacturing these days, with high levels of quality control, with technologies, with scanning, with uh, IT, we can secure mass production very efficiently with very little waste uh, at very high quality. And this is a significant factor in explaining why we've seen dramatic declines in prices in so many industries over quite a few years now. So in a sense, the origins of deflation, defude in, in Japanese, uh, have a lot to do with 
a combination of scale economies and considerable competition and efficiency in sales and distribution, passing on the benefits of those scale economies to customers. Because it doesn't always happen that way. You may have scale economies, but very often scale economies come about because of a monopoly provider. You've just got one big business providing all of the services and they can provide it or the product and they can provide it quite efficiently. But because there's no competition, they can capture lots of profits. They don't actually have to pass on the benefits of those scale economies to customers. Now there's a related concept and it's, and it's in the slides and that is the notion of technically efficient scale. Now this is another concept from economics and it simply reminds us that there is a scale at which things are produced that hits a high level of what economists like to talk about as technical efficiency, the optimum level of production, that uh, often you can exceed that. If you try to make too much at scale, there are going to be compromises in terms of quality, and in the real world of business, there are often supply-side constraints, there are often organizational control problems, and this is where many businesses actually go wrong. They start out very successful, they grow very rapidly, they grow too rapidly, and they lose the ability to actually maintain their quality because they lose the ability to control effectively. Uh, they have to source so many inputs, employees and, and many other inputs, and when they grow too fast, they often lose control. As the example of the omelet suggests, that certain things are best made in small batches, and this is a booming trend in a range of more premium consumer products. Uh, you'll often see this written on everything from whiskey to craft beer to gin, for example, small batch production. It speaks to notions of the artisanal, of people with a love of the product, working in often more traditional labor-intense ways, making a high quality product. So in a sense, the reason why consumers value this so much now is because we have become so accustomed to standardized mass production that we also want to add into our lives something a bit different, something a bit more artisanal, a bit more small scale, a bit differentiated. For example, when everyone has you know, the same MacBook Air or, or iPhone, uh, obviously we're not going to go out and just buy some contrarian phone that may not serve our functions, our functional needs as well, but we will try and differentiate our particular device or our product in a whole range of ways, okay? And so we, uh, we might add a very distinctive cover to it or something like that. And this helps to explain why you see this interesting mix of very large companies that deliver us the quality products that are really important for key functions in our lives. And we're quite happy to be supplied by these large companies that give us the reliability, that give us these great products at low cost. And then we want to add accessories or points of differentiation. And very often that's best done by small companies, maybe with a uh, distinct creative vision or impulse. And in a couple of weeks time, we'll talk about this and uh, how large organizations and cre creativity often don't go together very well. So particularly in this era of individual consumer curation of their own lifestyle, their own portfolio of brands and products will find that people routinely have a mix of those things that are quite high quality but not so differentiated. They're standardized, they're produced at scale and some unique things. We think about our own clothing preferences. We might buy a bunch of our innerwear, for example, from Uniqlo, which is remarkably good quality for the price. Um, mass produced, of course, capturing scale economies. And then we uh, might have some quite artisanal, distinctive designer pieces to give our own distinctive signature to the, uh, the way we dress. Now, there's uh, one other key concept that we have to keep in mind that really couches a lot of deep insights, and it is the notion of scope economies. Now, scope economies are like scale economies, but it's not making more of the same it's making more of related products. And if we see a whole bunch of companies in Japan, we can see 
that they are capturing scope economies. Suntory, Asahi, Kirin, all of them make alcoholic drinks, and that's a key part of their business, but they make lots of non-alcoholic drinks too. Because it's not just about brewing alcoholic drinks. There's so much about packaging, distribution, seasonality. All of those aspects means that the know-how or the skills that apply in the alcoholic drinks product range carry over very effective to non-alcoholic products. And then we see a range of, of uh, significant diversification that, that stems from making the alcoholic drinks. Suntory is particularly interesting. Suntory has some very significant investments and growing businesses in biotech. Now, biotech relates quite closely in some ways to brewing of beer. You need to have biochemists at work uh, to make very high quality uh, brews. And it's only natural that you might extend some of the know-how, the technological applications, the uh, knowledge-based competitive advantage you might have as a brewer to a range of other products. And we've seen Suntory, for example, has been investing in developing a blue rose, which seems a very long way from, from brewing. But clearly Suntory sees that there are synergies. There are... There's value to be gained from putting two different but related things together and leveraging up, that is taking advantage, earning extra returns on the know-how that you have. So just to reiterate, a few key concepts here reduced to some, some simple terms, scale economies, scope economies, and technically efficient scale. It's particularly these scale and scope economies that you want to keep in mind. And a final point on this, this is a key way of thinking about the rise of the modern corporation, particularly in 19th century America. There's a very famous book uh, by an economic historian called Af Alfred Chandler called Scale and Scope. And it was an exploration of the rise of large enterprises in America and then subsequently in Germany and the UK and Japan as key historical examples. So keep those concepts in mind. You're going to hear them over and over again. Uh, they are fundamentally important in thinking about why we see some larger companies and still lots of small companies that are both economically very logical.